Good evening. Good to know. Um, thank you all so much for um, being here. Um, in lieu of explaining or talking about the conceptualization of the exhibition, um, let me do some basic housekeeping. And then Matthew and I will go directly uh, into our conversation. An exhibition um, of the complexity that River of Fundament represents takes many, many um, people to make it happen. And I would like to focus attention first by acknowledging some of those people and, and then perhaps um, through our conversation the points about the work, the exhibition itself uh, can be elaborated. So first I would like to um, welcome Matthew and uh, please help me welcome Matthew Barney. I would also like to use the opportunity to welcome uh, Matthew's family, Matthew's mom, um, Marcia, and his sister Tracy. They are somewhere in the audience. And so um, I'm delighted um, that they are here uh, to see the exhibition. And um, so thank you. Um, Well, you know, finally, let me just simply say that um, the context of this exhibition um, represents what Hausekunz as an institution has excelled in for many decades, and that is presenting generative exhibitions, presenting works of artists at different stages in their career, oftentimes anticipating the emergence of key ideas and key works in the careers of the artists, and oftentimes using the exhibition as an opportunity to distill and to think through the propositions that the artists make each and every day. And for us to be able to do all of these things, for us to be able to generate exhibitions of this nature, um, it would not be possible without our supporters and funders. And I would like to acknowledge the support of our major shareholders, the Gesellschaft der Freunde, the Friends of Hause Kunst, the Schirkuba Foundation, and the Free State of Bavaria. Each of whom every day makes it possible for us to do what we do here and to be able to present this exhibition. So thank you to our funders. <laughs> Three years ago, I walked into a Glaston Gallery in New York on West 22nd Street, and I was immediately struck. Um, let me just back up. Um, in, in 1991, I had seen I believe Matthew Barney's first exhibition at the then Barbara Glasson Gallery on Green Street. Um, and of course, when you see the work of a young artist um, with the kind of incredible um, distillation of, of concepts and so on, um, it's thrilling, but oftentimes you don't know how far the idea will go. Uh, but Matthew Barney set an incredible you know, stage uh, that he has sustained over the last 25 years. And that exhibition uh, was as different as the exhibition I encountered in 2011. And it was 
my puzzlement and at the same time the visceral and intellectual um, intensity that I felt for this new body of work that made me approach Matthew to ask him if he would consider to um, present an exhibition on House the Kunst. And so I've told you my beginning, so Matthew, your beginning. How did this project, uh, River of Fundament, you know, start? What was the, um, the key impetus for the beginning of this project? Well, I think uh, th there was a, a great deal of doubt um, on my part with the, the image making that um, I had made up until that point, um, which is to say that the, the, the films I had completed before this project started, Drawing a Straight Nine in particular, felt to me like the end of a, <clears throat> an experiment. And, um, and I was starting to feel like I wasn't getting back as much as I was putting into it. And, um, and so I felt for sure I needed to change my way. And, um, and around that time, Jonathan Bepler and I had been um, speaking about the notion of, of making a live work <clears throat> and taking our collaboration that started in, in Cremaster and um, you know, bringing it out of the cinematic and into the, the realm of the performing arts and to, you know, to uh, stage some of these, these large physical complex scenes in front of an audience. And, um, and in doing that, to uh, you know, deal with on some level the tradition of opera, and um, you know we didn't know then, and, and I don't, I'm not so sure if we know now to what extent this is an opera um, or within that tradition, let's say. Um, but it has always been a part of the conversation to um, to leave behind that language we had been using before and to start a new one. So we started writing uh, scenes that would be performed live and and um, and in fact the the uh, uh, the first couple of scenes that we executed were performed in front of a live audience um, but to go back a bit the the that initial impulse um, came just before um, a more or less a kind of chance meeting I had with Norman Mailer um, just before he passed away where he uh, suggested this novel to me, Ancient Evenings, and, um, Close it. Close it. Yeah. Sorry. <clears throat> and, um, and this text is, it's, it's a difficult text, it's, it's dense, it's long, uh, it's full of characters, uh, hundreds of characters. Um, it's probably unfilmable, um, but I, I believe that he was proposing this to me as a as a film treatment, you know, or as a, a, a book that could be adapted for the screen. And you know, I said to him right away, it was not what I was interested in at the moment. I wasn't interested in uh, making a film, and so I started talking to him about this idea of it as a, a libretto, and. Um, and it grew from there. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away just after that, so he wasn't around for the, the development of the project, but that was another sort of starting point. Um, a third starting point, I would say, was the first trip that Jonathan and I took to Detroit, and um, it brought a lot of things into focus, um, you know, both on the level of um, storytelling and, and on a sculptural level. Um, I think the thing that compelled both of us about the novel was its Americanness, and uh, you know the, 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 that in spite of the the Egyptian mythology that runs through the the text, there's an Americanness to the language, which is true of any Mailer text. But for, in this case, I think it's there's such a a sharp contrast between the subject matter and the the voice. And uh, that interested me very much. And visiting Detroit galvanized this idea of setting the entire narrative in the United States and, um, and finding different locations in, in the States that could uh, align with the narrative. 
and it also um, it also brought up you know a range of material choices um, which have you know become the sculptural palette let's say for for this exhibition that um, that in Detroit there's a kind of uh, uh, you know, very visible layering of histories, um, starting with a prehistoric one, um, where you can see the the mineral wealth there. Where uh, beneath the city, there's a salt mine. Um, iron ore is plentiful. Uh, the coke and the limestone um, uh, needed to to make steel. Everything's available there um, in that in that basin in, in Michigan. And you know Henry Ford went there for that reason, to uh, to take everything from the earth that he needed to build the automobile and transport the finished automobile out on the riverways. And um, so it has um, you know beyond what we know about Detroit, it sort of has this sort of prehistorical mythological resonance to it that's very visible. Um, and of course the the uh, layer of um, uh, that that the industrial revolution left behind and the wealth that came from that, the, the sort of grand architecture downtown, um, and then the failure. And, um, and perhaps most importantly, the, the, the grassroots um, regrowth that's happening there now with um, young creative people in the city. So all of these things visible simultaneously um, really brought certain things into focus for me in the text. And um, in this sort of the elasticity of time that that the the novel has, and um, and it started to suggest somehow uh, that a range of materials that I had never considered using before: um, iron, bronze, lead, zinc, uh, copper. Uh, these more traditional sculpture making materials. Um, um, could be applied through the casting process that I was already very involved with in the uh, synthetic materials, and um, and so um, uh, yeah, I would say that first trip to Detroit was an important one. Well, <clears throat> it's it's just as well that you 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 just concluded this thought um, by connecting. Um, it, your, your, your sculptural work uh, that preceded um, uh, the, the current body of work, mm -hmm. and that is um, for many people, um, much of their understanding of your work um, has been dominated by the cream as a cycle. And you talked a little bit about this, you know. Conclusion of a, you know, a period in your in your in your work that led to new considerations. Can you talk a little bit about any connection that uh, Cream Master um, might have to River of Fundament? Because I think there is a connection, even though that the language of the materials are very is is very different, mm -hmm. and but the application, <clears throat> the methodology uh, using CAS and so on. Uh, still somehow, um, you know, exists in the current body of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, certainly narratively, there, yeah, there, there was a, a hesitation, let's say, that I had with with the novel initially, in that that the Egyptian narrative, I felt, was something I had already dealt with with Cream Master 3, you know, with the Masonic subtext of that work. And, you know, although it was, it was quite buried, I, I thought that's as close as I would ever need to come to dealing with Egyptian mythology. Um, so it's such a, um, I mean, it's, it's a difficult, that's a difficult subject matter to deal with, I think, in, in terms of how um, how often it's been used and how um, difficult it is to avoid cliche in, in, in terms of that um, you know that legacy, let's say, and um, and in, at the same time, I um, 
you know, it became uh, it became interesting to me. I think to to deal with that problem um, eventually. Um, I mean, there were other similarities I felt with Cree Master Three. The way that uh, the novel opens with a protagonist who uh, is dying or who is dead, and you're um, you're being led in a first-person perspective through the necropolis, and uh, and it felt very similar to me to the beginning of Cree Master Three, where the entered apprentice comes. Uh, up through the Chrysler building from the bottom, and and I wondered if um, I know that Mailer had seen Cree Master Three, and we talked about it, and and if he was making those same connections, I'm not sure, but I felt like I had to to use that as a starting point, and one of the first moves that was made in that story was to replace the central character with an automobile, with the surviving automobile from Cree Master Three, the the Imperial. The, Chrysler Imperial, and um, just as the protagonist in Ancient Evenings reincarnates three times, um, the automobile in River of Fundament changes from an Imperial to a Pontiac Trans Am to a Ford Crown Victoria. So there are three principal characters in this automotive language. Um, uh, that um, was another starting point. And in terms of the sculpts, because I think one, one, one clear thing to, 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 to say about this particular exhibition is how, distinct, how distinctively different it is from the previous ones in the sense that the film is not part of the exhibition. Why is that? I think that I have always... Uh, you know, I've always imagined my process, if I had to, to describe it graphically, as being a, something like an inverted pyramid, where you have at the top of this structure a text. Um, and that text is usually a film, um, although there are instances where it's a performance. Um, um, if I were a writer, it would be a lot easier, I think, <laughs> than um, going through the trouble of making a film to get to the point where narrative objects can be made. But um, um, but I'm not. And um, so, <clears throat> from that, uh, from the top of that structure, there's a process of distillation that that that, that happens and. Um, these objects are are um, drawn out of the text, and the drawings are drawn out of the objects. And um, so, I think that that's always been the case. Uh, but there's there's certainly something with this body of work that's um, um, you know where the I think the distillation is 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 more uh, um, let's say more pure. You know, I think that the that the objects in this in this body of work are different, and I wanted with this exhibition to place the object in front of the, the image, and um, and lead off with the sculpture, and um, so I think the as a exhibition strategy, it's very different. Uh, that's for sure. I think. Process in terms of my process, things haven't really ch changed that much. Well, it, it's it, but you did also change the language of your filmmaking because initially mm -hmm. we are not sure if you wanted to, to mm -hmm. continue with, you know, making, you know, film, and mm -hmm. you were fundamentally interested at that particular time in, mm -hmm. you know, a live piece, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, describe. You know the, the difference, you know, for you uh, mm -hmm. between the film River of Fundament, which, by the way, is five hours fifty minutes, and uh, and was conceived, you know, for proscenium stage and opera houses, uh, where you're trying to sort of to you know, uh, shift the focus from the cinematic to the more performative sonic experience that you wanted to recreate in a live situation and now transpose to film. What you know? What is the difference for you? Mm -hmm. 
I think maybe f first if I could finish up what I was speaking about before, that, that, um, that it's true that, that with the live performance uh, came a, a different set of concerns, I think, which, which I think runs through the whole project. And that has to do with this balance between the, the artificial and the real. And uh, I think that ratio has changed. I think it's one that's always been there, but um, I think to bring a real condition into the project was one of the challenges that we started with, um, to abandon some of the control and to abandon some of the artificiality that I was depending on more with the Cree master language. And, um, and I think particularly with the, the sculpture Jed that was cast in, in Detroit, um, within the performance, which was a, it's a 25 ton uh, iron casting that was made uh, during that performance. I mean, that's a piece that um, was, um, I mean, it, it has a, a quality of uh, which, you know, I haven't been able to achieve before in a sculpture, I, I believe. And uh, it has to do with this, um, um, you know, that it was made in a context, um, in a real world context. Uh, th there's, um, um, there were very, there was no way of intervening with the process once it began. Um, I mean, literally what happened is the, the, uh, the protagonist from the, the story, this Chrysler Imperial, was chopped into 14 pieces uh, and fed into the top of a, a system of furnaces, and they were opened, and um, 25 tons of iron poured out into the ground and uh, eventually found its way uh, through this medieval casting system down into an investment in the ground. And, um, that sculpture was cast. It's, um, it's obviously a very different approach. There's very little control in a situation like that. And, um, you know, it also, um, you know, brings to the table a different, uh, you know, notion of what investment means, you know, of, uh, in terms of, of taking the spirit of this uh, character, the, the imperial, and investing that spirit into the casting. Um, you know, it's, in, in my opinion, it's something completely different than anything I've ever tried before or been able to achieve. Was that frightening? Um, what were your thoughts when the process started with the investment of the 25-ton molten iron to create this incredible abstract work, mm -hmm. you know, Jed? Well, I mean, I think... Of course, it was frightening. It was, it was hugely dangerous, I think. And it, it, it was done in a way that was you know, non-industrial. It was done by a group of, of um, people who designed backyard furnaces for iron casting clubs. And you know, we blew this thing up 250 times, um, the type of system that they would normally work with. So it had a scale far beyond anything you know, anybody in that realm had, had, had attempted before. So I think nobody knew what would happen. But um, I think the, you know, the, the, the performance um, context for me, you know, in general has had that, that um, emotion. It, it, you know, it had, it was to do with letting go of, uh, of control and, um, you know, and bringing the real context into um, into one that was so uh, dominated by an artificiality and and um, and it's not in my nature you know my relationship to to performance is much more to do with with action you know to uh, perform an action for myself document it um, uh, for myself by myself and um, so I, I've never really had a very strong relationship to audience in that way, um, certainly in terms of theater. And uh, so to perform these these works in front of a group of people, I found um, quite quite frightening and quite um, satisfying at the same time. In the way that it reinvigorated, um, eventually reinvigorated my interest in making a film again, which felt quite good. Well, this is very important because. Um 
this performance you're talking about was the second of the three live performances uh, um, um, that um, runs through the entire cycle of River of Fundament. Um, can you take us through the three different performances? The first one was in Los Angeles in 2008, Ren, and the second one in Detroit, Coo, and the last one in New York, Bar. And so you, 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 you had started with the, uh, by saying that Ancient Evenings felt to you like an American novel. And your visit to Detroit was, a, you know, really reinforced that. There was an Americanness to it, and you wanted to engage with that. Is the, um, the, the, the transition from Los Angeles on the west coast of the United States to Detroit, the middle part of the United States, to, um, you know, New York on the east coast, you know, part of a way of to engage with this American epic, if you will. Talk a little bit about the three different performances and how they are related formally, both to the, um, the structures of the narrative of the sculptures, uh, which uh, in many ways are uh, embodied in the three automobiles that you've used, but also in terms of the, uh, the, the, the different aspects of reincarnation that you find in Norman Miller's Ancient Evening. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, the titles come from the, the soul states as they are described in, in ancient evenings, where uh, beginning with Ren, you have seven states of the soul that, that depart one at a time as one dies. And, um, and I think this became a kind of early sort of organizing principle for the project of, of, of breaking it into seven, um, seven parts. Uh, starting with Ren, which is the, the secret name, and that leaves first. Then uh, comes Sekum, which is the, the power or one's mobility. Uh, then comes the, the Ku, which is one's vision. Uh, then, um, then the Ba, which is the heart. Uh, and the Ka, which is one's double. The double comes and uh, tells the deceased their life story before their memory leaves. Then comes uh, Kaibit, which is the memory or the shadow, and the shadow departs. And then Seku is the remains. So um, there was th this interest in organizing the project that way, as those soul states were described. Uh, and then came this notion of, of first replacing the protagonist with, with the automobile and eventually with the spirit of, of Mailer himself. So um, through the, the narrative, there are three states of Mailer, or three states of Norman. And, um, um, and from there, a, a kind of three-act structure fell into place for the film. And, um, and within each act were these uh, live scenes. And um, Ren falls into the first act, uh, Ku in the second and Ba in the third. And in each of these uh, situations, the automotive protagonist dies a, a violent death in the first uh, um, in the first act, the imperial is is shredded to pieces in a uh, a showroom in a Chrysler dealership in Los Angeles in uh, in Ku. The Pontiac Trans Am is driven off the bridge uh, into the Detroit River. Um, and in Ba, the Crown Victoria is, uh, is demolished from the inside out by a mixed martial arts fighter. So they were organized this way. Perhaps we can see uh, a few of the clips um you know, from the, from the, from the film. Uh, by the way, let me just, um, I, I think I, 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 I was remiss in not mentioning uh, the fact that the film River of Fundaments um, will be shown tomorrow at the Opera House and will subsequently be presented here at House of Kunst, uh, we hope, beginning in April. And the film um, is authored by Matthew Barney and Jonathan Bepler, the composer. 
just to uh, mention that. So let's see the, uh, some of the clips. Many lights appeared above my head and they were like a ladder of lights with many rungs. I seized the first and began to ascend from the river. The ladder twisted and was not easy to climb, but as it swayed, the fields of gold on the other bank receded from me. Y fuerzas feroces son condición. Obviously, the, 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 the conditions to, for seeing this piece uh, doesn't exist here in this uh, current form of the, of the clips because the sound that you can see, um, the music and the visual and the sound and the actions uh, are really mesmerizing. And so maybe Matthew, tell us what we have seen in some of those scenes and what have we not seen what do we not see <laughs> well i mean those are very quick clips aren't they um <laughs> i mean i tried to choose a range of um of moments for this talk which um which would show the three um live contexts um the, the so-called house context, the house is the, the, the set that was created, um, which was a, a reconstruction of Norman Mailer's brownstone. And um, that runs through the film from the beginning where um, in a more or less naturalistic way, um, you're at uh, the wake for Norman Mailer. And um, in those scenes you have um, a number of people from Mailer's social circle, circle um, giving their condolences to um, the widow who was performed by Joan LaBarbera, who's a, um, um, a, um, a singer, um, experimental singer, who you saw in one of those clips. Um, there are other characters um, performed by actors. Paul Giamatti, for example, plays a... a a pharaoh, the pharaoh in reigning, uh, who um, um, comes to greet the, the widow and uh, eventually reveals to one of the, the spirits of Norman that, uh, in fact, he's not a good leader. Um, um, there are other characters that belong to Egyptian mythology set 
uh, Neptus, Isis, they're present at the wake, um, and um, they remain as the naturalistic guests leave. So over the course of the film, this house uh, scene, or this uh, the context of Mailer's house, changes. The, the, the guests leave, the gods remain, um, these spirits from the underworld come up the stairs of the brownstone and enter the house. The house starts to fall apart, um, and um, the, as it's revealed later in the film, the house is traveling down the East River in New York on a barge, like a funeral barge, and um, um, occasionally we cut away from this house scene uh, into the landscape in Los Angeles and Detroit and New York where the more mythological aspects of the, the text are played out. Uh, for example, the battle of, between Horace and Set is in one of these uh, scenes in the Brooklyn uh, Navy Yard in the dry docks where um, Horace and Set go to battle in, um, in that space. Yeah, you, you've, you've talked about how uh, narrative is um, in many ways germinal for how your sculptures are presented in an exhibition. Can you elaborate a little bit by what, how narrative figures in your sculptural production and particularly how the sculptures that we find in this exhibition um, emerge out of the film? Well, I think that I've, I've always on some level been a storyteller. Um, with regard to my my sculpture making practice, I, I think um, uh, in there's also been a kind of uh, let's say an interplay between uh, uh, the the narrative from the text or the film um, against the the material narrative. And I think it's something in, in this body of work that's quite um, strong or more out in front that certain aspects of the narrative are told through uh, a material narrative or a progression through um, the materials in the sculpture, you know, from the literal um, sense through the, the three automotive bodies, you know, which, which um, features prominently in the, the form of the sculpture to um, a more abstract, um, the more abstract notion of the material choices and how, um, you know, there's a central theme in the text which has to do with the ambition to uh, achieve um, everlasting life or the, the state of uh, gold in the material sense. So this progression from the base metals from lead zinc, um, elemental copper, uh, bronze, brass, through the yellow metals toward, eventually toward the state of gold um, is something that is very present in the exhibition and in, in the sculpture. This, um, this ambition to reach the state of gold and in the way that a number of these pieces are trapped in the state of brass or bronze um, on their way to gold but not yet achieving it. There are a number of gold pieces which are um, are veneers, you know, they're plated um, or leafed, but um, their ambition, like the protagonist in Ancient Evenings, is to become um, gold, and um, and it's one of the things that interested me very much. The this um, narrative between the the nobleman in Ancient Evenings and the pharaoh that the the nobleman wants what the pharaoh has and he can't have it. He, he wants to, to live again and um, through trickery and through devices he learns how to be born again. Um, um, but the trick only works a couple of times and then he becomes stuck. Um, he has to enter um, the womb of a woman in his dying breath and, um, and he can then father himself and it works twice, and then he's, uh, in the third attempt, he's stuck inside the womb. 
and he can't get out. And, um, and so the way that, um, you know, the way that this dis is described um, in the text influenced a lot of the, 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 the it influenced this um, material narrative that runs through the, the uh, sculpture. Mm -hmm. What might you say about the, the conditions of House of Kunst as, as a venue and how you responded to the conditions in the presentation of the sculptures? Um, was there an attraction for you in terms of you know, the spaces and how, you know, and how did the layout of the show emerge from that? Mm -hmm. Well, a space like this is is ideal for me um, in the sense that it's episodic. You know, I think that it's 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 easy to install a work in a or an exhibition in a narrative way, which is how I tend to do it. And here, these um, the the movement from chamber to chamber, and the the specificity of the door is very useful to me. Um, that aperture and the way that the next room is framed before you enter it, um, those are useful um, tools for me. Um, you know, I think that there's a there's a formal quality um, um, and a historical quality in this in this building that that are um, um, useful in terms of the you know the way in which this feels like a mausoleum. Um, uh, and the way that the narrative has to do with um, these uh, bodies in repose or these these bodies at rest, um, as you'll see, the the, the 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 exhibition is predominantly horizontal. It's a, there's a there's a, uh, a sort of st the state of the body at rest um, again and again in these in these rooms, and I think that that this quality of this building uh, reinforces that. Mm -hmm. And um, just to make a connection, um, because we, we've talked about the relationship between Cremaster and River of Fundament. Um, here, um, you, you're presenting a, um, a site-specific work, which was completed a few days ago, um, which comes out of uh, your ongoing series, Drawing Restraint. And, uh, in, in, in the production of the work and the result, there is a kind of incredible paradox between, you know, the fragility of, 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 the, of the result and the methodology through which that result was achieved. So, you know, how has your, you know, the drawing restraint, uh, you know, process continued to inform your, your practice, why have you stayed with it? What makes drawing restraint still so fundamental you know, to your work? Because this is how you started um, you know, more than 25 years ago. Well, I think similar to, to some of the first things we, we talked about, um, the drawing restraint has always functioned for me as an interval between things and um, a, a, as a way of letting go. Um, so the early drawing restraints were these studio exercises where um, a, a problem was set up for myself uh, to make a drawing, and um, um, you know the problem was physical. You know it was to restrain the body and um, uh, make a drawing under that restraint, and. Um, you know, I think I was interested in that both from a, a kind of athletic and psych psychological um, perspective, but, but also from a formal one. And um, in terms of the line quality that came out of the exhausted arm, and, um, and I think as time went on and the work became more and more narrative, you know, so too did the drawing restraints. They became more, uh, more narrative. And, um, um, the action we performed in here was executed by a group of women from a, um, a football, an American football team um, called the Munich Cowboys, who um, who came and 
pushed and dragged a 5,000 pound block of graphite around the space and made a very delicate drawing on the wall, which, um, um, which I think changed the room completely. And, um, and, um, and I think as you're saying, it, it, it brought a lightness into the room that it, that it really needed. And um, um, I think that's consistent with the way drawing restraint often functions in that way, that there's a, you know, with that lack of control, um, some of the will of the mark making is removed and um, um, that sort of residual mark is, um, you know, it's a much more feeble um, gesture. Well, I, I'm very sure there's a lot of anticipation to see um, the exhibition. Um, just before you know, we end, um, I would like to um, inform all members of the audience that should you want a ticket to the opera tomorrow night, it's unfortunately sold out, um, but we do have uh, I believe available, um, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, I've not been briefed properly, but I think we do have maybe about 30 tickets that you can procure at the front desk. I've been asked to announce this. <laughs> so, um, um, so I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been you know, uh, asked to announce this. I think um, that um, the the, the, the experience of the, of the, of the, of the film um, really requires the kind of conditions that the opera you know, has, you know, presents. And I would like to use the opportunity to thank Matthew Barney and Jonathan Pepler so much for this brilliant film. But also, I would really like to thank Matthew for the privilege um, to develop this exhibition here in House of Cones and for the commitment to make it happen. Matthew, thank you so much. Thank you.